That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Linoleum! The sophomore film directed by Colin West, which premiered at the 2022 South by Southwest Film Festival and is being released courtesy of Shout Studios on February 24th, 2023. Do you know Colin's first film? It's, uh, Double Walker from 2021. Uh, a ghostly love story-ish thing I have not seen. I thought this movie was excellent. I did quite like it. I think that you have to be prepared to get through a somewhat dry first 45 minutes at least. So I, uh, it was not what I was expecting at all. I thought it would be sort of a quirky comedy because of Jim Gaffigan, who I like. I like his comedy. Most of his film work I do not appreciate. Oh. Uh, such as last year's Collide, uh, if you remember. But... Uh, <laughs> He, yeah, I, I think it's not giving what you would expect it to. I agree the first hour was rough because I didn't know what I was getting myself into. But the final 30 minutes, I was crying the entire time. So I, I think looking back at the story, I really, really like it. And this would be one of those films where I feel like maybe spoiling it is helpful so that a person is not distracted by some of the things that made the first hour. I mean, I will admit it was also kind of difficult to sit through. Because I didn't know what it was. Well, it wasn't that... It, it's just that it took me a long time. It's a slow burn into being led to care for these people. Let's say sure, that. Sure, I agree. <laughs> and the story is... It's very abstract and kind of... It's interesting. And I don't know that it's easy to describe, but I'm going to try. It's about a married couple. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling it out of sequence, but we see the man... Cameron, mm -hmm. as a little old man on basically his deathbed and his wife caring for him. And she he's suffering from dementia, so she's showing him mementos to try to, like, uh, as Tony Braxton would say, rejog his memory. So, but that's the very end of the film that we see that. So the entirety of the film is this story of this person that is not told from the perspective of the actual person whose memory, whose mind we're actually inside. Delving into. Mm -hmm. So the story we're seeing is that Jim Gaffigan is playing this guy who's like a Bill Nye sort of character who has, or has like a Bill Nye type show, but it's like on public access at midnight, so it's no one's watching it. And he's not treated very well by the people, who, like the TV station. And he and his wife are in the midst of getting a divorce. Mm -hmm. So things are kind of patchy. His kids aren't really... You know, they seem kind of, like, disappointed in him. Then there's a neighbor who moves in. A guy who looks just like... It is played by Jim Gaffigan. And he's an astronaut. So he's living the other Jim Gaffigan's dream. And the astronaut Jim Gaffigan has a son named Mark. Mm -hmm. And it's actually Mark who's the supporting character whose memory we're witnessing. Played by Gabriel Rush. Mm-hmm. And I sort of took all of what we're seeing as like aspects of his memory based on the mementos his wife is showing him on his deathbed. Yeah. For instance, it's in the trailer where like a, like a classic red Corvette falls from the sky. And then we see in the end that his wife is showing him like this Hot Wheels version of that car. But the astronaut Jim Gaffigan moves into town because he's taking over the other Jim Gaffigan show. And then the... Um, I guess like the loser Jim Gaffigan version, he has a daughter. And that daughter, Nora, has, Nora is sort of like has a relationship with Mark, the other Jim Gaffigan's son. Mm -hmm. But that relationship is complicated because Nora identifies as maybe being queer. Mm -hmm. And then Mark, who does gravitate towards her, there is a moment when, like, he questions his sexuality, but it's clear that they both are attracted to each other. But where things get real hot, and this is when, like, the 30-minute mark comes, or, you know, after the hour mark, the astronaut Jim Gaffigan finds out that his son is seeing Nora, and he's mad. Like, I don't want you hanging out with that queer. If I see you with her again, I'll kill you. We see that he's kind of like a religious fanatic and, like, lashes him with some which is odd because he also takes over uh cameron's science show it is interesting well. but 
In the end, we find out that Mark's dad tried to like run him over with his car because like he said, I'll kill you if I see you with this girl again. And Mark did go see her again. And then it appears that maybe the astronaut dies in the car crash. But everything culminates at the end with the Jim Gaffigan who lost his show, the science guy, he, a big plot point is that like a... This space race rocket from that the news media is saying is Russian has landed in his backyard, which means his house is suddenly off limits. So this rocket ship crashes in his backyard and the science guy, Jim Gaffigan, and his wife who are in the middle of a divorce. It's important to know the wife is also like into aeronautics. And used to be part of his TV show. So she, they kind of bond again because they start rebuilding this rocket ship. And the sort of culmination of that is that they're saying like, we need to, uh, what do you call it when it? Launch. Launches. Mm -hmm. And that memory of the launch is relating to the, the old Cameron in his death on his deathbed and his wife telling him like it's okay we can launch it like it's okay you can die now mm -hmm. and then we see them launch the rocket at the end so yeah so the the climax is really this kind of an odd mix of memory and metaphor and uh -huh. all of these things coalescing in uh, I think a very intriguing and it, a, a way that actually pays off I, I think it forgives a lot of the maybe confusion and slowness of the I know that my recap was confusing as hell but like you said I think knowing that we're witnessing someone's memories on their deathbed and it's disjointed and there are mementos informing these memories mm -hmm. it, it makes sense but again the first hour it was hard getting into these characters because they feel exaggerated they feel exaggerated and, and derivative even uh and the whole thing with Again, Jim Gaffigan and this this doppelganger version of him, neither of whom are very likable or compelling. Um, and then a wife played by Rhea Seahorn from Better Call Saul, whose character I also and, and she has this obnoxious sister that's obsessed with Hawaii and beaches. Like I, I didn't really like any of them, uh, but I, I felt myself warming up much more quickly to Nora, played by Caitlin Nakin from Wa The Walking Dead and Gabriel Rush, because uh, they do share kind of a nice chemistry. And it's really at the hour mark where this violent incident in school happens where I suddenly found myself feeling kind of bored and I was then all of a sudden in, kind of instantly invited in and I just wish I'd felt that a little I earlier. I understand and I agree because I was frustrated through the first hour um, but I do think that these characters that feel exaggerated and derivative it makes sense when we think about for instance like Nora I didn't like her character when we first meet her but that's because Cameron's memory of her before he met her would be exaggerated. And then at the point when he does actually meet her, that's when she softens to him because mm -hmm. clearly he fell in love with her. So again, looking at it after I watched it, it made sense. And so then I really, really thought it was an excellent story. Um, but when we're watching the fake science show... Uh, mm -hmm. Above and Beyond... I kept thinking like, oh, I wish we got more of that. Sure, because it's kind of fun. Because it's it, cute and fun. It gives me mystery science theater vibes uh -huh. uh, a little bit too. And, and I like when I finally start warming up to the wife, uh, played by Rhea Seahorn, uh, is when we realize that, oh, she had a very happy time with this man. And it was, uh, you know, kind of tied into this television show. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when this repetitive phrase about doing something fantastic that's uh, right. Really, I, I think starts to resonate with me in this film and about these people whose lives have become, you know, suddenly uh, without, you know, how, how life happens without us planning to. We're doing something we didn't really plan on doing and it's not what we dreamed of doing. And it's about reclaiming a sense of we can make changes and do those things. And I was very distracted by the logistics of the rocket ship crash landing and the government saying the house. Like I was very fixated on that. But then in reality, that probably never happened. It's just mm -hmm. a metaphor for right. exploring the things that really excite them. So again, had I known that that, that was not real, it, it would have washed over me in such a different way. Sure. So in that regard, I do think that the hour, the first hour could have been finessed in a way that isn't so frustrating you said and now i can't not think about it i i did like the actor playing mark and i thought he looked like 
Jesse Eisenberg, mm -hmm. but then you said Tom Holland. Yeah. And I think it, this actor looks like if you mix Jesse Eisenberg and Tom Holland. Sure. But uh, I did really like him. Uh, he's a little bit younger, but he's in Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. I don't know if you saw that. Um, uh, an aspect of this character that really spoke to me is he when he meets Nora and she's saying like I like girls so don't worry I'm not into you I just kind of like your vibe and he's like okay and then he says to her well you know I like to wear women's panties and at first I thought he was kidding mm -hmm. like just trying to smooth things over with her but then we see that he does wear women's panties which culminates with the scene you alluded to where this mean girl at school fools him into bending over so she can take a picture of him wearing panties and then Nora sees what she did and sees that the class is laughing at Mark and she knocks the shit out of that girl and that's what I was like yes yeah um, that girl who's not pretty enough to be as uh, vicious as she is but I thought that that was such a I don't know for, for some reason I, 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 I just really liked how that presentation of this young guy who still he says he's still a virgin he's not an adult yet and still trying to figure himself out i thought the symbolism of him exploring like wearing women you know like panties but then ultimately maybe never was gay was was so interesting it's interesting because there's so many human experiences mm -hmm. and, and, and tendencies and idiosyncrasies and peccadilloes that are never explored on right. film because we have been conditioned to only show a certain aspect of lives and people. Yes. So there are there are all kinds of weirdness and kinks and, and interesting explorations that have yet to be showcased anywhere in American film, at least. So I really appreciated that plot point. Yes. Uh, we also have uh, Tony Shalhoub as Dr. Alvin, who, who is part of the cast, as well as uh, Michael Ian Black. Who I've always liked. Mm -hmm. um, the mean girl, before Nora knocks her lights out, um, she... She's throwing a Halloween party, but Nora also wants to throw a party. And that mean girl says to her, like, no one wants to go to your dyke party or something really awful. And then it felt so sweet when Halloween night comes and everyone shows up to Nora's party. Mm -hmm. And then that mean ass girl has to like, like sulk and go over to Nora's and ask, like, can I, like, like can I come in? And of course, Nora and Cameron are kind. And, mm -hmm. uh, and Mark and Nora's birthday is also Halloween. Mm. Then... Another plot point is that we see that science guy, Jim Gaffigan, his character has a son, this kid who, who never speaks and is always kind of like disconnected from the group. And we actually see that little boy in like photos that are taken mm -hmm. with Cameron and his girlfriend in the end. And then we find out that there was never a brother, that that brother like was a stillborn, I believe. Mm -hmm. But... You know, uh, uh, like, like, again, this old man on his deathbed remembering that he had a, a brother who never was, I thought was also really sweet. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I was crying, like, the entire end of the movie. It reminded me of something, a short story I would have read as a kid in some science fiction magazine or even maybe something by Ray Bradbury that, that was having memories and vibes of, of those that kind of material towards the end. The... After Nora punches the mean girl, she gets in trouble and is in the principal's office and her parents come to pick her up and they're riding in the car and the parents are arguing with her. And at a moment, she yells at her dad, like, how did you marry this woman? That was a good scene. And then the mom tells her, like, F you. And then that turns into something. I thought that was really well done. Mm -hmm. uh, the title, I, I think, is interesting as well. Because uh, I kept thinking it meant how much like linoleum we our lives end up we end up having to settle for something cheap and plastic a, a cheap plastic version of something that should be quality <laughs> i like that explanation when you asked me what i thought i meant what what it meant i immediately thought that when i explained how hair works you know a hair strand is covered with the cuticle layer mm -hmm. and oftentimes that cuticle layer gets stained with color so no matter how much you bleach it whatever color that you put on there, your stupid manic panic pink, it won't come out. And I always reference linoleum because linoleum has that clear coat. And sometimes when it gets stained with something, no matter how hard you scrub, it won't come out because it's um, stained in that top layer. So that's what I kind of thought this title meant, like relating to memory and how some things will just never, like no matter how, you know, as dementia sets in and we lose our memories, there are certain things that are always just stained on our mind. Um, and, and I think Tony Shalhoub has a quote about uh, describing a character who's got, it's like there's plaque on cheese without a brain 
toothbrush or something? Something like that, yeah. Um, my final note, and another thing that made me cry a lot too, is we see early on in the film that science guy Jim Gaffigan, he has like a spaceman outfit, mm -hmm. like as a, a, what do you call it? Like a, a memento. A memento. And the helmet, the glass in the helmet is cracked. And we see it several times. And then we find out in the end that the reason that helmet is cracked is because when his dad tried to run him over, he dropped the helmet, Cameron did, and the car hit it. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was such a powerful symbol of like... And that's also the same outfit he's in as when we see him as the old man. On his death He's imagining himself in. And I think it just represents so many things like our innocence and, you know, like the joy we once had and like what we could have been and how life and people and influences rip away at that. And then what you're left with is oftentimes shattered. So that made me cry too. <laughs> but overall, I do think this I think it's an overall a hopeful tale too, though. Well, because watching the wife on the, like at, at his deathbed, caring for him and trying to remind him and then he's dying. So she calls the ambulance and then she gets in the ambulance and, that was all very beautiful. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, it is a very sweet story. I agree. What would you give it? Three and a half. I would give it four out of five. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>